This is a fun book. It really is. It's a, an adventure romp into the deep Amazon with all that goes with that, the danger, the risk, the, uh, the, uh, the culture, the language. It's also got some great chapters in here on the linguistics of uh, this language of this tribe. But my favorite, and I think your favorite chapter, will be the last chapter in this book. The book is called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. So save the last chapter for dessert because it is just a, it's just a wonderful, from us, from our point of view, especially from me being a former missionary too, like Daniel, we have the same first name. I was told that the word Daniel means God is my judge, right? But I think we're proving the opposite. I think we, you and I are proving that we are God's judge, right? Dan, Danielle. Daniel Everett is the chair of languages, literatures, and cultures at Illinois State University and the author of this really fascinating book, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, Life and Language in the Amazonian Jungle. It came out last year with Pantheon. And in part, it recounts Daniel's loss of faith under the example of a tribe called the Piraha, an unmissionized, or as the Catholics used to say, an unrepentant, or a recalcitrant tribe, um, who, as he writes, a tribe of people who have shown me that there is dignity and deep satisfaction in facing life and death without the comfort of heaven or the fear of hell and in sailing toward the great abyss with a smile. Daniel Everett first went to the Amazon in 1977 as a missionary. He learned the language, which was quite a feat, but he didn't quite finish translating the Bible into Piraha. And we'll let him tell us why he never finished that. There's a documentary being made about him. It's called The Grammar of Happiness. It started filming in September, and it's being, it will be aired internationally as being developed by Essential Media Entertainment of Australia. And if you want to see a slideshow from some of the filming of that documentary, go to our website under Convention Speakers, and you can see a brief slideshow of images of, of that upcoming film. Thank you, Daniel, for coming here today and for rearranging your trip to London. And after, Daniel will sign copies of this, and there's also a paperback. He'll be signing here right after the speech. It's great to be here. I'm taking off, uh, as he said for, uh, Dan said, for London to speak at the Royal Institution about the evolution of language. So this is not about the evolution of language. This is about the evolution of my beliefs coming into contact with the Pitaha people. Uh, my connection with Seattle and religion is, is, a, is a mixed one. In 1968, the summer of 1968, I was standing out in front of a Jimi Hendrix concert. You know, Jimi Hendrix is from Seattle. Uh, in San Diego selling LSD to get money to get in. And uh, <laughs> I met this uh, young, young girl, a uh, very cute girl, and, and we started talking, and it turned out she was the daughter of missionaries. And it began a long trip uh, uh, for me into the Christian church and the Christian faith, and then out again uh, many years later. Uh, and and I, the last words that were spoken by the previous speaker about... Uh, uh, the impact from family and friends. That's been the greatest impact in my life. <clears throat> Many people don't know that Billy Graham wrote an undergraduate dissertation uh, on, on blood atonement in the cultures of the world when he was a student at Wheaton College. And he began the idea that later became known as redemptive analogies, which is the idea that God has prepared every culture on earth for the coming of the message of his son and, and the uh, need for salvation. And that's a very powerful message. I'm going to tell you in a bit that it's not true, but uh, <laughs> it, you probably know that I'm going to say that or I wouldn't be up here. Uh, but uh, it's a very powerful message. Years later, in the, in the 70s, in the early 70s, a book was uh, published by, and, and then promoted very heavily by Reader's Digest called uh, Peace Child. And that was the a book written by a, a missionary with regions beyond missions in New Guinea, Don Richardson, in which he discovered, and when he first started telling Bible stories to the people that he worked with, uh, they laughed. They thought Judas was a hero uh, because they thought it was great, according to his account of the culture, 
to, to be a trickster and lead people on and do the opposite of what they thought. And so he was really confused. How did he get the message of the gospel across to a people who thought that Judas was the hero of the story? <laughs> And then he realized that they had, they had wars with neighboring tribes. And he found out that the way they stopped the wars among these neighboring tribes, and I'm, all basing, I'm basing everything I'm saying on his description, whether it's right or wrong. I often find that when I double check the anthropological literature much more carefully, these descriptions don't work out to be that accurate. But forget that. Let's just take it at face value right now. And, and he found out that, um, that the only way to stop two tribal groups from warring against each other was for one person from one tribe to give a baby to a person in the other tribe and they called that the peace child. And as long as that baby lived, there would be no war between them. And, and so he said, aha, I have it now. Jesus is God's peace child. And so he told them that Jesus was the peace child from God and that Judas killed the peace child. And so now they don't like Judas, and, and they began to convert to Christianity in large numbers. Um, now I'll get back to the ethics of missionaries telling stories uh, in, in a bit. But um, he related this to, to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And so for those of you who haven't gotten back into Gospel of John in some time, let me just review that for you. And, and it's a fun study in the Greek. Uh, John, as you know, was a fisherman and had a vocabulary uh, that was pretty small in Greek. He, that wasn't his native language. Spoke of, so it's a very impoverished vocabulary. But he starts off, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Uh, and the Word was God or a God. It depends on how you tr translate that both translations are possible and completely irrelevant. But uh, uh, the word that was translated word is, is the Greek term logos, which is where we get, you know, anthropologos, anthropology, and, and it's, you know, it means the ultimate reality, and it comes straight from Plato. And Plato is the one who said that uh, what we see here are, Plato was a really uh, religious uh, fascist, if you look very carefully into what he wrote, but uh, he said, what we see here are just shadows of the real, re of the ultimate reality that uh, lies behind all of this. So when John started off uh, uh, his story in, in uh, chapter one, telling the people that the Logos was God, uh, Greeks found that fairly easy to believe, but not in the Christian sense, in the sense that this was the ultimate reality. But then he gets down to verse 14, and he said, and the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And for the Greeks, that was really uh, difficult and to, to understand, to accept that idea at all. But it was the entrance of Christianity into Greek culture. And that was used by Don Richardson and Billy Graham and others as an example of a redemptive analogy. The Greek culture was prepared by Plato to accept the message of, of uh, the gospel. Now, What's wrong with this picture? Uh, what, what is going on here? Well, I want to tell you from, from my own experience and going to the missionary field I, with my, uh, uh, I now have a PhD in linguistics and, and I, I uh, mainly uh, write about uh, the intersection of language and culture uh, and it has nothing to do with God. But when I first went to uh, Brazil in 1977, my only degree was an undergraduate diploma in Bible and foreign missions from the Moody Bible Institute in <laughs> Chicago. And uh, I went very, uh, believing very strongly that this country was gospel hardened, that nobody here was interested in the gospel, uh, and that we needed to go take the gospel to the places where it had never been, carrying, uh, uh, and, and all the, I could give you a lot of verses. I just preached on this a lot, so I get, you have to be careful not to get carried away there. But uh, taking, taking this word to people who had never heard it before and who needed it and who would want it. So it was my impression that when I arrived at wherever I was going to be, there would be a group of people standing on the shores <laughs> delighted to receive me and hear this wonderful message that I had for them. Well, the first thing I had, to, I had to deal with when I got to the Piraha was that I didn't do my background reading as any anthropologist would. As a missionary, I felt this was a new story with me and God. Why did I need to read about these people or anything? So um, 
they were they were and are monolingual. One of the only groups known in the world that are that are completely monolingual. They don't speak any other language. And so, you get off the plane and you try to. I got off a little uh, Cessna missionary plane and try to talk to them, and they say something like, and uh, so you try to write that down and uh, <laughs> figure out what that means, and uh, it, it turns out to mean don't speak to me with a crooked head, speak to me with a straight head. And what that means is that the Pitaha's language is apaicheso, a straight head. And uh, our language, any foreign language, is apagaiso, crooked head. And, and they call themselves, they don't actually call themselves the Pitaha, that's a Brazilian term, and nobody knows really what it means. They call themselves hiaicheje, the straight ones. And we are all awe, which means bent. Uh, <laughs> They're ethnocentric. I didn't tell you they were completely virtuous. A lot of people say that I'm, I'm claiming they're this uh, absolutely perfect group. They would not say that about themselves, and I certainly wouldn't say that about them. They have, uh, they have their own issues, but one of them is not God, and I'll talk to you about that. Um, so the first thing I had to do is, is study the language, learn the language of the Pitaha. And it turns out that you can't study the language of any group uh, unless you also understand their culture and how the language comes out of their values and their beliefs and, and the things that are most meaningful to them. Um, I did start to do a little background reading on them because I knew that the Protestant missionaries that had succeeded me, they started working with them in 1959. The first team with Wycliffe Bible Translators, which was the mission I was with, worked from 1959 to 19. Uh, 67. The next team worked from 1967 to 1976, and then I came in in 1977. And they had had absolutely no results whatsoever. <laughs> and, and, and this was a very difficult thing to understand. And I, I believed that, you know, I was smarter and God was going to help me more. And I would find this redemptive analogy. I would find this key, the, this little... Uh, Trojan horse that God had put into their culture and, and, and let out all their spiritual beliefs and they would find out that they were, in fact were religious. But I, I read also the account of the, of the first Catholic missionaries that worked with them in 1784, which abandoned them after just a couple of years as the most recalcitrant people they had ever encountered <laughs> in the entire Amazon. The Pitaha, when, when you go there, their culture doesn't seem that impressive. They, you know, my first impression after a while was that they just seemed like a bunch of people on a camp out. They just were <laughs> lying around most of the day. And uh, I didn't see much ritual, no body painting, no feather decorations or anything like that. I hadn't yet been with them to the jungle, which was the big revelation about their culture to me, how they are in the jungle. But superficially, there didn't seem to be much. They just seemed to be a group of uh, just a commune of hippies living in the Amazon, is what, <laughs> sort of my impression, except they worked a lot less hard than other communes I had seen it. Peter Hire is so good at fishing. A man, I, you know, I've, I've, I told people when I first saw an uh, Indiana Jones movie that uh, that's silly because one Indian running behind him would have riddled him with arrows. Uh, <laughs> they would have, uh, much less a whole group of Indians. They, they, they don't usually shoot unless, I've never seen a Peter Hire man miss at, with a bow and arrow at anything he's ever shot at. And I've been with them hunting and fishing and seen them just get in their canoe and, and go out into the river and fire three times in succession and pull up three fish uh, with bow and arrow. And, and they are really amazing at what they do. And because they're so good at it and because they have such a great area to live in, uh, this Mycie River with 300,000 hectares for their own reservation, which I helped demarcate, um, they are able to provide for themselves so that it takes the average man. I would say that the average person works about 15 hours a week to make a living. Uh, and and they, they eat just fine. Hunters and gatherers, as you all know, have better diets than we do. They eat better and more variety and, and healthier foods than agriculturalists by and large. In fact, uh, Jared, my, my friend Jared Diamond's written a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel in which he, he talks about the downside of agriculture for the development of a lot of human societies. And, and uh, the Pitaha live, it's not an idyllic situation, but it's, it's pretty close. I mean. Uh, looking at it. You just have to have really tough skin so you don't mind bug bites and stuff like that. And they all have tough skin, so it's uh, different. Um, so into this, I had to talk to them about God. Uh, so as I learned more of the language, I remember being so excited because uh, this young boy showed up at the village 
And I, I asked the Pinaha fellow, and he said, uh, and I realized that means his father sent his son. Oh, there's a great, there's a great expression for me uh, to translate. Uh, and so I, I actually I, I built up gradually the ability to translate parts of the Bible. And so I, I, um, I read to them uh, my translation of part of the Gospel of John one night, and I, I gave them my testimony. And, and as you know, anybody who's got a, any re remotest connection with the Christian church, giving a testimony is supposed to be a powerful thing. You talk about how once I was blind and now I see how I went from, from this very bad background uh, to this very good person that I am today. So I told them my, uh, I gave them my testimony and I told them about, you know, my stepmother committing suicide and how that, and when I got done telling them, they just all burst out laughing. <laughs> And, and I said, you know, what are you laughing about? I was really hurt. You know, why, why are you laughing? They said, we don't kill ourselves. You people kill yourselves? What is this? You know, like, <clears throat> I realized they don't have a word for worry. They don't have any concept of depression. They don't have any schizophrenia. Uh, they, a lot of the mental health problems, and, it's not, and they treat people very well. If someone does have any sort of handicap, and the only ones that I'm aware of are physical, they take very good care of them. When people get old, they feed them. I remember this one guy, he, he was too old to get around, he couldn't hunt, he couldn't even gather firewood anymore, and they would bring him food every night and, and help him chew it, even helping him with his jaw. And I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, does it bother you to give him food? I mean, he's not doing anything. And they said, uh, when I was a little boy, he put food in my mouth and took care of me, and now he's an old man and I take care of him. <laughs> And I, I noticed they didn't, they didn't store up food. They, they, they know how to smoke meat and they know how to salt meat, but they almost never do that. When they bring in meat, they give it away to everyone. And I said, uh, don't you want to keep meat for tomorrow? He said, I keep my meat in my, in my brother's belly. Uh, <laughs> that's where I keep what I have. Uh, I store it with my friends. There were a lot of values there that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't prepared for. And actually, those sound pretty much like values that a lot of religious people ascribe to uh, or aspire to, and yet they had them. And so, um, I rem so then I had to start working on, on their belief system. I needed this for the translation, and at, at this time I was starting to get interested in anthropology and linguistics. So I wanted to find out about the creation myths. And another universal, uh, many of you might know that the, the great French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss died uh, on October 30th. And I've written an obituary of him that's going to come out somewhere. I'm not quite sure yet. But uh, uh, Levi-Strauss worked in Brazil, and he worked in places very close to the Pitaha. In fact, he worked one, one tribal group over uh, with people that the Pitaha know. And, and one of the proposals of Levi-Strauss uh, and many other anthropologists is that creation myths are universal, and they actually have uh, uh, ways of interpreting this and ways of... Uh, theories of creation myths and myths in general about series of oppositions. So I, f I couldn't wait to hear what the Pinaha's creation myth was. So I asked them, um, so what was the world like uh, long ago uh, before there were Pinaha? Who made the trees and who made the water? And the guy just looked at me and says, I, what? <laughs> I said, who made the trees and who made the water? Nobody made the trees and nobody made the water. They're just trees and they're water. I said, but, you know, a long time ago, when there, there weren't any trees, he said, you saw a time when there were no trees? <laughs> I said, no, no, but didn't your father say? He said, no, we don't, we don't talk about that. He said, no, the trees were always here, and the water was always here, unless you know that they weren't. I mean, I don't... Uh... So, so I thought, well, maybe this guy's just, you know, some unusual person. I'll find somebody else. And so I worked with people after people, and um, with person after person in the village, and no one could tell me about a creation myth, except I finally found one guy who started telling me about the creation. Now, he told me, he said, um, uh, long ago, there was uh, a big spirit, and he, he is our heavenly spirit. He's the up high spirit, and he had, a, he had another spirit that worked for him, sort of like his son, and he sent him off... Um, 
and he told him to create things and, and live on earth. And I said, hey, that's this, I'm, I'm in business now. I'm finding, the right, I'm finding the right story. But it turned out that this guy had been the translation helper for the previous missionaries <laughs> and was telling me back what I wanted to hear. And, and uh, I got out and I told, I told some anthropologists, I said, I think this is the this is the first group that doesn't, I know of that doesn't have a creation myth. I think there are others. and In fact, I think a lot of the things I said about the Peter Hall will turn out to be true uh, in, in other groups as well. But several anthropologists wanted to study the Peter Haas. So an anthropologist from the University of Rio, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, went to the village. He didn't speak the language. I gave him a tape in the language introducing him to the people. And, um, but he felt that they had to have a creation myth. So, so he brought back, he came back six months later and he came to my house in Sao Paulo and he said, I found the creation myth, you were wrong. And I said, oh, well, let's hear it. And so we, we put on the tape and uh, it starts rolling and he tells, he asks, what, did God, what was made first? What, and he, has, he says this in, in Portuguese but also trying to use the phrases that I had given him. And there's a silence. He said, what was first? And then you hear in the background somebody yelling to the speaker that he's recording, bananas. So <laughs> the guy says, bananas. And he says, uh, and what was next? And somebody yells out, monkeys. And so he says, monkeys. And so there's this disjointed list of things. And then they start talking really quickly. And he thought, well, it took him a while to get into it. And now they're telling me the story. And, um, and I'll take it to Dan, and he'll translate it. So, so then the, the Pinaha said, hey, uh, uh, Dan, he says that you're listening to this, too. Um, and um, when you come back, we need, uh, we, we want some matches and uh, some fish hooks. <laughs> and, and so there was, a, they don't want many things from the outside, but they gave me a list of the things that they did want, and that was their creation story. So what do we make of that? Well, some people have tried to explain it and say um, they don't have a creation myth because their, their culture was destroyed by the Europeans who came conquering them. Um, well, it is true that a lot of the, I mean, the greatest genocide I know of in the world is what happened to the American Indian in the North and South America where maybe as many as 98% of the population was destroyed in the Americas by uh, diseases. Um, and, and direct killing, uh, most of them by diseases, where uh, actually if you read the book, which I highly recommend, 1491, about the Americas be prior to uh, the arrival of, of the Europeans, there is, there's actually evidence that the oldest civilization in the world is not Sumeria and Mesopotamia, but Guatemala, uh, and that the first major civilizations might have been American Indian. Also that the uh, first, uh, probably the greatest invention in human history, which is corn, uh, was invented by the Mayans. Uh, so a lot of, uh, a lot of things from uh, uh, over 50% of the food that we eat, uh, including one of my favorites, chili peppers, comes from uh, American Indians. But, um, but in st so, so there, were, there was a trauma uh, in these cultures. They were deeply affected by, by the outside world. But it's not clear that that even matters in terms of finding a group that today doesn't have a creation myth because the Pitaha have been described by missionaries and, and travelers for about 300 years. And as far as I can tell, they haven't changed much at all in that period of time. So they, they never had, I apparently, a creation myth. Nobody tells anything about creation myths. If you ask them about God, they don't understand it, even when you translate it. I remember a missionary came in, another missionary who didn't believe he needed to learn the language, and, and used a mixed Portuguese and some other language called Nyingatu, which used to be spoken in that area, which the Pitaha remember a little bit of, or know a little bit of. And he preached a sermon when I wasn't there, and I came back, and a Pitaha guy said, I used to want to go to town, but I don't want to go to town anymore. I wanted to see how Brazilians live, but I don't want to go there anymore. Why not? Well, this guy came, and he said that uh, he said that this guy he said was God, and Jesus wanted me to go to town, and they were going to put me in a building that I couldn't get out of, and they were going to kill me and take me to heaven. That's how, that was his message. That's how he interpreted going to church, and and then afterwards <laughs> going to heaven. And he didn't know what heaven was anyway. For the Pitaha, here's a, here's a very interesting view of the universe. I I looked at the ground, and I 
got the word for ground, Miggy. And I got the, ground for, the word for the ground is wet, the phrase, Miggy e hui. And then I looked up at the sky, and I asked the Pitaha, you know, what's that called, Miggy? Um, <laughs> it sounded like the word for ground. And it turned out that it was the same word. And for cloudy sky is Miggy e hui, just like wet ground is Miggy e hui. And it turns out that the Pitaha have just, the, the universe is layered. And we happen to live in this biosphere that's bounded by the sky and the ground, which are just both barriers, so they're both called Miggy. Uh, and, and there could be entities above that, but they wouldn't be supernatural entities. They would be entities like us, but maybe with different characteristics of some sort. Uh, and there could be entities below that. But the Pitaha don't worry much about that because they live where they're at now. In fact, I began to realize that not only do they not have creation myths, they do not have, uh, they have the simplest kinship system known. They just have a word for generation above, uh, no gender distinction. Uh, my generation, no gender distinction, which is brother, sister, cousin, uh, uncle, anything like that. And generation below, which without any gender distinction. And then two words for biological son and biological daughter. And that's that. That's the Pinaha kinship system. They don't have any words for colors. They can describe colors, they see colors, but they'll say that looks like blood, or that looks like the urukun plant, or that looks like water, or that's not quite yet ripe, uh, or that's transparent, or that looks like it has an opaque eye. And those are the ways they describe different colors. They don't have any words for numbers. In fact, the article they published uh, in the journal Cognition was chosen by Discover Magazine last year as one of the top 100 science stories simply because it's the first time a group has been documented that doesn't have any numbers, not even the number one. Um, but I'm sure there are others, but this is the first time it's been documented. And, and they don't have quantifiers, so they don't have a word that means all. They have a word that means a lot of. Actually, we don't tend to use the word all in its most precise sense. So like, uh, you know, if, if your son or daughter comes home and says, but but mom, everybody's going to the party. They don't literally mean everybody. Uh, they just mean the people that they know they consider relevant. Um, and we can use the literal meaning back to get a laugh, but not out of our children, when we say, it can't be the case that everybody's going because you're not. <laughs> That's not the meaning that they were using. Uh, they don't have words like that. They, don't, they have words that mean like a lot, that have more or less the function of all, but not that precise function of all like we do. They don't have uh, a, a number of characteristics that we thought they might have had. They can whistle the language and hum the language. They don't have to use consonants and vowels. And they don't have creation myths. So um, I thought and thought and worked on this for years and years and finally decided to put forth a hypothesis that's become really controversial. Uh, it's gotten me vilified by lots of people and, and other people on my side. just depends on what you believed before you heard my hypothesis. Uh, and, and that is that the most imp one of the most important values in Pitaha culture is what I call immediacy of experience. If you look at their stories, they don't talk about things to come. They might talk about what they're going to do tomorrow based on the things they're doing today. They don't talk about the distant future. They don't talk about the distant past. All of their stories and all of their songs have to do with what they did today, what they saw today. They don't make a big distinction between dreaming and regular experience. They don't think that dreaming is just regular experience, but it's another experience, and they don't talk about them as being that differently. Why wouldn't they have color words or number words? Because these generalize and they, they range across things that go beyond me immediacy of experience. Uh, they don't have creation myths because that's certainly something you haven't experienced, is the creation. Why would you talk about something if you can't experience? And so they, in fact, have suffixes that go on the end of their verbs that, that tell you whether, the, whether they saw it or they overheard it or they, or they inferred it. Um, and evidence is very important to them. They're sort of like the original uh, show me state sort of thing. You know? <laughs> or, or as one philosopher said, the ultimate empiricists. Well, I wasn't ready to give up on them. I wanted, to, I wanted to get to the bottom of this, and I felt surely that if I worked hard enough, I would find the, the redemptive analogy still. So one, one morning, about 10 AM, I was sitting there having coffee with uh, a, a group of men in the village. They, they do love sweet coffee. They mainly like the sugar, and you can put as little coffee in it as you want. <laughs> uh, 
And, and we were sitting around having this brown sugar water. And uh, one of the guys said, hey, Dan, I, I want to talk to you. Um, you know, you've been here for a long time, and we know that you love this place. That's why you came here, because this is the most, this is a beautiful place. We have lots of fish here, and you don't have that in the States. And, and he said, but, uh, you know, we've had people tell us about Jesus before. Somebody else told us about Jesus, and then the other guy came and told us about Jesus, and now you're telling us about Jesus. And we really like you, but, see, we're not Americans, and we don't want to know about Jesus. Um, we don't. You know, we like to uh, drink, and we like to have a good time, and, and, and we like, um, you know, the equivalent of multiple sex partners is the way it came out, and, uh, uh, and, and that, that applies to both genders. Uh, and, and, and he said, so we really don't want to hear about that. You can stay here. We like you. We like your kids, but we don't want to hear about Jesus or God or anything anymore. We're tired of that. So I felt like, well, you know, they don't want to hear about it. It's... I, I shouldn't tell them about it. So I moved to another village. I spoke the same language. And, and I had been there for several years, and I showed them film strips. And, and actually, this is a very interesting thing. <clears throat> a lot of indigenous groups like the Pitaha don't make a distinction between fiction and fact. I mean, they don't have this tradition of theater. So if I show them a film strip or a movie of Jesus, they think that's real. It's It's... And so you could say that it's actually deceitful to show these things because you're coming from another culture with all this money and all this access to power and all these and airplanes and all these things you can do. The people want to please you. For all they know, you could call in a bombing raid and have them wiped out at some point. They don't know what, what you are really to deal with. In fact, just three years ago, three years ago, Peter Hawk guy said, hey, hey, Dan, do Americans die? I said... Yeah, we die. Why? Because um, you're really, really old, and you're not dead yet. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm not that old. Yes, you are. You're really old. And um, I didn't want him to do any empirical investigation of the possibility. But uh, um, when you show them these things and you tell them what you believe, they believe you've got some reason for saying it. So. So they came around, and they, a group of men at this other village said, Dan, um, so, so tell us a little bit more about Jesus. Is he, uh, is he brown like us, or is he white like you? And how tall is he? And, um, and, and what sorts of things does he know how to do? Does he like to hunt and fish and stuff, or what does he do? And I said, well, you know, I don't know what color he is. I never saw him. You never saw him? No. <laughs> well, um, your dad saw him then. Because you can, you can give information that was told to you by somebody who was alive at the time. And I said, no, my dad never saw him. They said, well, who saw him? And I said, well, they're all dead. It was a long time ago. Why are you telling us about this guy? <laughs> if you never saw him and you don't know anyone who ever saw him, and those are the two basic forms of evidence for the PETA, huh? Why would you tell us about him? We don't want to hear about this. <laughs> So then I made, I, I, I translated it, and I paid a Peter Hahn to repeat after me on the tape to s the Gospel of Mark. So I did translate the Gospel of Mark, and, and, I, and I had this Peter Hahn guy saying it, and it sounded pretty natural. We had a little music to it, hand crank, tape recorder, and I gave it to them. And, and I sat around a group of, with a group of men around the fire, and they're playing this, and they're understanding it. I know they're understanding it because they're asking questions, and they say, who's talking on this tape? Sounds like Pehuatai. And I said... <laughs> I said, it is Pehuatai. And they said, he doesn't believe this stuff. <laughs> and he never saw Jesus either. <laughs> so uh, that was the end of it. But as I, as, I, as I started working with, you know, really paying attention to this, I realized that, you know, what do I bring to them? What, what is the message that I'm supposed to be giving to these people? That they're lost? They're not going to feel lost. I mean, in my evangelism teacher in Bible school said, you've got to get them lost before you can get them saved. And if you can't make this people feel... That's why David Livingston, when he went to Africa as a missionary, said that the first step of missions is to destroy the local culture. Destroy it through capitalism, because as you create a desire for Western goods, they will realize how worthless they are, and they will listen to the missionary about their God. 
that is an effective strategy, by the way, that the, the church growth movement that was alluded to earlier is also a movement in missionaries, uh, among missionaries. And it says that the groups most likely to respond to the message of the gospel are groups that have been traumatized. And so those are the places you should work, among traumatized groups, and then tell them about the gospel. Um, this is not a big surprise it's, uh, that, that people who are down and out on their luck, somebody else comes along who's rich and powerful and tells them, here's how I got rich and powerful, uh, they, they, might, they might believe that. But <clears throat> what I was trying to say didn't fit, and it, it became clearer and clearer to me that it didn't fit. And when, when I it was just completely irrelevant, and it was even more than a feeling of irrelevancy, it was a feeling of profanity, that I was profaning something very beautiful by telling them that I had access to truth that they needed, when in, clearly I didn't. Over the years, I've taken a lot of people with me to the Peter Ha to do different kinds of research. So I took a team, of, and, and these claims about no numbers and no quantifiers and this sort of thing is, have been really exciting. So in 2007, I took a, I took a team of people from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Brain, and Cognitive Sciences. And they went down to do some experiments. And while we were there, one of them, uh, who was actually my first PhD student and now a full professor at MIT, said, these seem like the happiest people I've ever seen in my life. And I said, yeah, well, how would you measure that? I think they are too, but when I tell people that, they say that's silly. So how would you measure whether they're the happiest people or not? Well, as, in, as true psychologists, they said, uh, we measure the time they spend smiling and laughing, and we measure the time that other cultures spend smiling and laughing, and that's probably not a bad indication. They said, one, one, as one of them said, I haven't seen I haven't looked at these people at any one time and not seen the majority of them looking happy. And when the group went down from the, uh, uh, doing the documentary, we were just down there uh, in September, uh, we, we saw all these Pitaha lying around on the beach, uh, pretty much just lying around on the beach most of the day, <laughs> talking to each other, and they said, I don't sense a lot of angst here. Uh, <laughs> so... <clears throat> What is the likelihood that there are lots of other groups like this? And what are the lessons we can learn from the Pitaha? Well, for one thing, the Pitaha are happy without God. And that violates a lot of the predictions, not only of religious uh, 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 folks, but of anthropologists who believe that God is an essential ingredient of all cultures. That's false. There are cultures that get by just fine without any concept of God. Um, the Pitaha have very little coercion in their culture. You don't tell other people what to do. You, uh, one person, one adult doesn't tell another adult what to do. There are expectations, and when they're violated, they can be, uh, they can be uh, remedied in different ways. So, for example, most pitaha are promiscuous during the, uh, t during the full moon when they're walking around in circles, or you can call that dancing, but it's basically walking around in a circle singing and, and having a good time. And... and uh, uh, and so there was this, I went to get this fellow to work with me on the language one day, and I walked up to his hut, and I didn't really pay much attention to the configuration there, but I, I said, can you work with me? And his head was in his wife's lap, and he started to raise his head, and she had him by the hair, and put it down and whacked him on the head with a stick. <laughs> and, and he grinned, and he said, I can't go today. I have to, <laughs> I have to stay here. Uh, and I said, why not? He says, oh, I don't know. And uh, so I left, and I asked another guy, how come his wife's hitting him in the head? He says, oh, well, because he was out with some other woman last night, so he's got to sit there today, and he can't move. And that was the end of it. That's, that's the punishment. Uh, there's no form of marriage. There's no form of dis divorce except that if you want to get married with someone, you go away with them for a couple of days. When you come back, you're married. And if you were married before that, that's also the divorce. And, and that's the end of it. There's no more to do. There's no, nobody to pay, no, nothing to say. And people who were crying and screaming and wailing because their spouse ran off with another spouse a few days before are done with it when they get back. And there's, they have very interesting ways of dealing with uh, their problems and dealing with the issues around them. They're individualists. Everyone is pretty much responsible for themselves. But if you can't take care of yourself, then they will take care of you. Children are pretty much autonomous from the time they're 9 or 10. A boy knows how to fish very well when he's 9 or 10. He doesn't need his father to feed him. He'll do what his father says if he feels like it, which most of the time he does because his father can get more fish than he can. 
and his father will share with him if he gets fish. Uh, but they, they are raised by the village. If the parents go off, they might take their children or they might leave them there, but everyone takes care of them. So it's a very interesting combination of individuality and group responsibility. Um, are there other groups like this? I'm almost certain that there are. And I think that many of the descriptions that we have in, in the ethnographies that have been written by anthropologists over the centuries have been done by people who have their own biases. Whenever we go to a village, we have a bias. Whenever we go to do this kind of research, we have a bias, whether it's theoretical or culture or religious, and we have all of those. Uh, and so we find anthropologists who, like Malinowski, one of the fathers of uh, modern anthropology, uh, kept uh, two sorts of journals. He kept one journal about uh, the cultural observations he was making and another journal about his personal reactions. And he hated the people he was working with. He said terrible things about them in his journal. And, and uh, he tried to keep them separate. He kept them separate in his journals, but I doubt if he kept them separate successfully in his mind. Uh, all of us, whether we're scientists or missionaries, take biases with us. But as, he, as William James said, um, uh, to coin a phrase of his, it's the varieties of human experience, to paraphrase an expression of his, the varieties of human experience are very important to us. As I hear about uh, uh, studies and, and generalizations based on um, what religion does for us, uh, like, like what we, we just heard about the professor at Harvard telling us how religion improves this and improves that, we need to look at mul a multitude of cultures, as many cultures as we can, we can look at in our survey, not just this one culture that, has, that comes from European culture that has over 2,000 years of Christianity uh, affecting it tremendously and has given us this great concept that the Pitaha show very, very rarely, if at all, which is called guilt. Uh, we live in guilt and Christianity takes away our guilt. We have been made lost by uh, religion in many respects. And, and finding, un, finding salvation has become the task of so many uh, Americans because they've been told that they're lost in one form or another, this guilt and, and the, the oppression uh, of religion. As I began to think back on it and reflect uh, at night of all the people I had met, it occurred to me that the most important lessons in my life were from meeting people who were not like me, whether they were um, Brazilian intellectuals or uh, people from other religions or people who had no religion or, or people of other races and ethnicities. These were the lessons that, that had most affected me. So when the BBC asked me recently for this 60-second idea on how to change the world, um, I said, uh, live a week with, with strangers. And, and I highly recommend living with strangers, whether it's, and, and by yourself. Take, take a week off. I, I, I hear now about this, this, uh, this show called Wife Swap where <laughs> women, they do sort of live a week with strangers. But I had in mind even more profound difference. You know, find, if you feel, especially if you feel uncomfortable with the group, go try to work it out to stay a week there and just live with them. Learn from other people. Uh, and learn how different people come up with different solutions to the problems of the world. The, many of the problems that face all of us are the same from culture to culture. They, they, they can vary as the culture plays a bigger role in, in setting the problems. But in terms of the biological problems that face us all, survival, uh, happiness, uh, uh, food, uh, uh, clothing, shelter, these beset all of us. And how have different cultures solved them? In a big rainstorm in the Amazon, which is a pretty current, uh, common uh, occurrence, the Pitaha's flimsy little houses very often blow over at night, at 3 in the morning. And everybody's sopping wet. And what, is, what do you hear from them when this happens? Everybody's laughing. They think it's the funniest thing that ever happened. My house blew over. <laughs> and so what do they do? They move into somebody else's house. When we were there doing the film, uh, uh, they were all sleeping on the beaches. And, and it was dry season, but nevertheless, a huge storm blew in one night. And, and there was no shelter because they had just come to see me and they were all sleeping on the beaches. So I knew exactly what they were going to do, but I didn't say anything to anybody. They all came on the boat. A hundred pitaha came on the boat and it just scared everybody else. And uh, uh, they just, but it was fun. And, and they can't understand, why would you mind missing a night's sleep, you know? Just sleep a little bit more tomorrow. What's the big deal? You know? um, they can build sturdier houses, but it would take more work to do that. They know how to do it. 
but why spend your time doing that when you can spend it lying around talking to your friends? Um, it's going to be very difficult for any missionary to uh, have, have a foothold in the Pitaha. There is no redemptive analogy there. There is no logos that became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, there is no peace child among the Pitaha. They are who they are as the result of a long period of evolution. I should say they're not related to any other known language in the world. We don't know where they came from. Uh, we don't know where their language came from. Uh, we only know that they're very, very different. But in that very difference, teach us something about ourselves that we couldn't learn otherwise. We learned that not all the things we thought were universal are universal. Not all the things that make people happy are necessary to make people happy. And that the idea that somebody died on a cross 2,000 years ago that nobody ever saw, nobody knows anybody who ever saw, has any relevance to my happiness or my life in any way today, um, we might take a lesson from the Pita Haas skepticism there. And thank you. Since Daniel has to leave, we're going to skip the questions. And if you want to come, he's going to be here at the table for maybe 15 minutes or so uh, for a book signing. So um, the books are available in the back. Is that right? Come back here at 2 o'clock after lunch. <laughs>